Pardon? I've been told to remind everyone to put their phones on silent. So that's the first thing I'll do. So good afternoon and uh, welcome. It's, it's uh, my pleasure to welcome you to our uh, Jonathan Mann uh, lecture, which is one of our, our signature lecture here at the Dornstaff School of Public Health. Um, this lecture is, is, is named to um, remember Jonathan Mann, uh, who uh, was a, a, a very important figure in the history of, of public health, uh, a, hum a true humanitarian, and, and what we were fortunate that he was founding dean of our school for, for a short period. Um, he was a, a pioneer in, in work on AIDS and, and a founder of, of a movement to really link health issues with human rights. He was a real visionary in this area. Um, uh, and uh, he was also founder and, and first director of the World Health Organization's Global Program on AIDS. Um, I think many of us who, who come, came to the school have been inspired by his vision and his uh, words. And if you have a chance to read some of his papers and commentaries, I strongly encourage you to do that. Certainly when I, when I first came to the school, um, someone gave me a packet with his writings. And it was remarkable for me to see um, you know, how he was um, really uh, forward thinking and talking about many of the things that we talk about now as the social determinants of health and health equity um, many years ago. Um, so we're very, um, you know, honored to have his lecture uh, in his, rem this lecture in his remembrance um, and, uh, and, and his values, the values that he created for the school in terms of uh, health as a human right continue to drive everything we do here in terms of research, teaching, and practice. Um, so before we, oh, I introduce today's speaker, I, uh, I would like to ask uh, Marla Gold, who was our Dean uh, Emerita, to uh, come up and say a few words in memory of Walter Cohen, who uh, is also a, a, ve a very, very good friend of the school who uh, passed away not too long ago and who has supported this, this lecture series. Good evening. So uh, it seems a little weird for to be the first year that we're having the man lecture and that before we begin that I'm going to be up here saying a few words about Walter. Um, but we wanted to do uh, Walter Cohen, who uh, supported this and so many other things, uh, the appropriate uh, justice as we uh, begin uh, this evening's lecture. As someone who also had the opportunity to work with John Mann and to have had Walter uh, all along and then to be uh, the honor of working with many of our esteemed colleagues today and students. Uh, for me, it's a particularly incredibly special day. And then you add Sophia here and just hit blend. It's, it's fantastic. Let me say a few things. If you've been to a man lecture before, you often saw Walter Cohen come up on stage and introduce the speaker. Um, and as I, I have known him for so long, it, it will surprise you. He passed away this summer at the age of 91. Um, and when the service happened uh, over the summer, for those of us who were able to attend in, in July, uh, his daughter, his, who's uh, in her 40s, stood up and said, why is it that a room full of people are shocked at the death of a 91-year-old man? Um, but that is exactly uh, what happened. So let me say a few things about it. Um, most of you never really knew him. You just saw him again, as I said, as an elderly gentleman who came up here uh, to talk about the speakers. If you do the proverbial look up uh, in a scholarly way, or if you Google Walter, you'll say, oh my god, he was a dentist. Um, and indeed, he was practicing up until about five years ago um, in a dental operatory. I, I want to let you know that he, I know him because he became president of the Medical College of Pennsylvania, where I trained. He became president in 1986, then chancellor in 1993, and then he rode through all the name changes with us. He was also chancellor of Allegheny University of the Health Sciences, and he also was someone um, who had the opportunity to work alongside and to know Jonathan Mann. Um, he was later named Chancellor Emeritus of Drexel University College of Medicine. And the things that I want to say, I could go on and on, but to do with health and human rights, 
Of interest, in 1997, Walter established the Walter Cohen Middle East Center for Dental Education at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, which offered an exchange program between dental students at Hebrew University and Palestinian students at the al Qad School of Dentistry in Jerusalem, which he did both for teaching but also as an act of peace, um, which Walter believed strongly in. He received the French Government Legion of Merit, was chair of the Pennsylvania Diabetes Academy, president of the National uh, Museum of American uh, Jewish History, named many chairs uh, around here. I want to let you know he received eight honorary doctorates from universities, including the University of Bucharest in uh, Rum Romania and the University of Athens in Greece. I could go on and on. Um, we have a wonderful program plan, but I do want to say this. At the age of 80, um, one day, uh, it was in fact Valentine's Day in 2006. I was dean of this school, I had that honor, and um, he invited me for breakfast. And so we met at his favorite breakfast joint because he had a thing for always having to have capers with his eggs. Um, somebody has to eat capers. But anyway, so he loved his capers with his eggs. And it was an ice storm. So 80-year-old Walter trudged across the city wearing rubbers, not the kind you think public health students, but in fact the kind that you put on your shoes. Um, he trudged through the ice storm while the pellets were falling with an umbrella open, coming to work to meet me for breakfast. And at that breakfast, he leaned forward and said, I want to an endow an, endow an annual lecture. We'll put it in John Mann's name, and here's the first money to get it started, and I'm going to bequeath the rest to keep it going. But I'll give it to you every year that I'm alive, which happily was a very long time after that. Um, and so he asked me to be his Valentine, which I intend to be forever in his memory. Um, I suggest all of you join me on that journey uh, as we honor today's speaker and also the memory of John Mann uh, for Health and Human Rights. Uh, Walter was a statesman, a mensch, a fabulous educator, and he leaves uh, very many philanthropic ventures, including this school, uh, behind. Uh, as we say, may his memory be for a blessing, and I'm sure it is in all of us. So thank you for being here today, and we'll keep moving through the program. Thank you. Thank you, Marla. Um, so now um, I have the pleasure of introducing our uh, speaker um, this year. And um, we're very fortunate to have with us Sophia Gruskin, um, who, who is the director of the Institute for Global Health and also directs the program on global health and human rights at the University of Southern California. Um, she holds appointments both at the Keck School of Medicine and the Gold School of Law at USC. Um, and her work is really at the intersection of public health, ethics, and law. Um, so very appropriate uh, speaker for, for, for this lecture. Um, Sophia has really been a pioneer in, in applying a, a health and human rights approach to global health. Um, and, and in really using a health and human rights lens to look at a range of, of public health issues, including HIV AIDS, sexual and reproductive health, child and adolescent health, gender-based violence, uh, non-communicable diseases, health system functioning, among others. And I actually learned today that she was doing the same thing with respect to the sustainable development goals, which uh, are health relevant as well. Um, she, she really is internationally known for this work, has uh, led many uh, number of different uh, research projects, sits on uh, many different boards and committees, and has really, uh, I think another aspect uh, uh, that's um, I think very important to highlight is that she's partnered with many, many different types of groups and organizations, from grassroots all the way to the sort of international um, uh, bureaucracy, uh, the international organization. So I think um, I think that's uh, really an, an indication of the breadth of her of her work. And last but not least, uh, she was a colleague of Jonathan Mann. So it's particularly, I think, poignant that she's able to be with us today um, and, and, and to speak at this lecture. And, and we are delighted to have her join us. Hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, 
Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, it's wonderful to be here, and I, and I have to say, I'm kind of blown away to learn about all the wonderful things that are happening here at Drexel. Um, so many of those, I think, embody the values that Jonathan brought to this work. And, and I have to say that I'm also particularly honored to have this opportunity to speak as part of this event, which commemorates uh, Jonathan, who was my mentor. He was my colleague, and he was my friend. Uh, and I, I hope to be able to put out some ideas uh, to help stimulate some conversation uh, and some discussion. But I did want to acknowledge just up front just how deeply honored I am to be here and to be part of this event. And I thought I would explain a little bit about why I chose this topic. Um, like perhaps many of you, um, I'm engaged a lot not only in my local space, but in global spaces. And I'm acutely aware that what happens in those spaces can, with both intended and unintended consequences, really affect people at the most local level. And to give you just a fairly recent example of, of what I'm talking about, um, I was in Cote d'Ivoire a while back for a research project that I'm engaged with. And in the course of my work there, I met with the key populations network. Now, I didn't know what a key populations network would be. Certainly in the course of my work, I've worked many times with uh, sex worker networks and organizations of people living with HIV, but this was my first time to deal with a self-defined key populations network. And while the network brought together uh, sex worker organizations and organizations of people living with HIV, what was striking to me was the ways in which the definition of key populations, which is something that had found its way into the technical documents of a global organization like UNAIDS and like the World Health Organization, was now because of funding, but not only because of funding. Uh, impacting the self-proclaimed identities of people at a very local level. It was impacting the bonds that people were forming, the ways in which they were working together, and the claims that they were shaping together in terms of working with different arms of national government structures. And so what became really clear to me is that when, whether one likes or believes in the UN or not, uh, the definitions that are promulgated there um, actually matter. They matter conceptually. They matter theoretically, but they also have a real impact on people's uh, lived experience. And I believe that nowhere is this perhaps more than the case than in the relationship to sexual rights. And that's why I chose kind of this as the focus for this talk. And so while my talk title um, is really about engaging human rights for global health in big, I'm going to use sexual rights as the thread because uh, I hope to be able to make the case clearly for what I mean and to be able to show how this matters no matter what our area is of engagement. And because when I'm sitting in an audience, uh, I want to know where things are going. I put you up this road map just so you have a sense of kind of where we're going uh, in, in general. Um, and I also wanted to take this opportunity to quickly acknowledge some of the wonderful people that I've been working with around whom some of the ideas that I'm going to present today um, have shaped and, and where we've worked together. So let me begin by defining my terms. And again, perhaps because of my initial training as a lawyer, I think it's incredibly important to define what I mean. And so when I use terms to be clear about what I mean when I use those words. So when I say global health, I'm talking about the commonality of issues uh, that we're all addressing regardless of borders. Because we share so many of the same health issues, whether we're in LA or Philadelphia, but also in Bogota or in Ouagadougou. And so I can only say that we need to think together about how it is that we work to address them. And when I say human rights, um, what I want to say about human rights is not what I want them to be or what you want them to be, uh, but where there's international agreement about what they mean and what obligations they carry. And so I'm trying to give this as a definition to kind of frame where I'm going. And before moving to sexual rights, I thought I would say something about the link between health and human rights, and particularly to say something about John Mann. Um, because even as human rights and public health had been implicitly connected for a long time, and there had been a lot of work uh, done to link them in the women's health movement, 
The first time that human rights were explicitly named in any public health strategy was not until the late 1980s when John Mann was director of the Global Program on AIDS at the World Health Organization. And it was Jonathan who made, ex like, who made explicit and who made sure that the first WHO global response to HIV called for the human rights of people living with HIV and AIDS and for compassion and solidarity with them. Now, it was also John Mann who was the first to hire a human rights officer within a global health organization. And by putting a human rights officer uh, within the global program on AIDS, that has had huge implications going forward for the ways in which institutions understand these things to link. But it's also worth remembering that the reason that Jonathan originally hired Katerina Tomaszewski was because he didn't know what to do with all of the reports of violations of human rights that were coming across his desk. And it's worth remembering that the reason that they were landing on his desk was because other institutions, nationally and globally, wouldn't accept them. So just to be on this ramp for kind of a moment, um, I have to say that one of the great things about working with Jonathan uh, was that he challenged people in both public health and human rights to think and act beyond our comfort zones. Uh, when I first met Jonathan in, in 1988, it wasn't just the public health world that didn't want to deal with human rights. The, human, the world of human rights was not open or interested in dealing with HIV. And so it was really Jonathan's vision uh, that helped make the worlds of HIV aware of human rights, but also to place HIV on the agenda of human rights organizations. And this is what led in many ways, not only to HIV and human rights being linked, but to the world of health and human rights that we all care about. And I can say more about that in the Q&A if people are interested in giving a bit more context in terms of Jonathan's role and the things that, that he said. So let me move now to, to sexual rights. And to say, first of all, when I say sexual rights, do you think we all mean the same thing, even in this room? Uh, do you think that we all define sexual rights in the same way? And I say this because it's kind of a strange time, let's be honest. Um, and I'm asking us to think not only in terms of the US, uh, but we can start there. Um, but first, just to say that never in history has there been such an opening up both societally and legally, to the range of things we understand to fall under the rubric of sexual rights as we have now in 2018. There are large-scale initiatives around guaranteeing contraception and family planning to all people in ways we haven't seen them in decades. There's an unprecedented number of countries that are accepting gay marriage and at least acknowledging the existence of gay, sometimes gay and lesbian, sometimes gay, lesbian, transgender populations. Um, but there's also this growing recognition of sexual assault and sexual violence as a serious crime by governments, by institutions of power, and by the general public in a whole lot of different places. But at the same time, on the other end, uh, we're seeing a huge and growing backlash against many aspects of sexual health and rights from all corners of the world. And I'm including not only outright violence and homophobia and anti-abortion actions by government and civil society actors, but also retrenchments and commitments to comprehensive sexuality education and to many other aspects of sexual health and rights that we once thought were not contentious and that we were well beyond. And, and of course, one of the elephants in the room is, of course, the current president of our country uh, and his administration, who is doing all that he can to uh, erode and dismantle protections for sexual and reproductive health and rights, not only within our own borders, but, in the, but across the world. And I do kind of want to make reference to what happened this week that I think we're all aware of, where Trump and his administration are trying to narrowly define gender as a biological immutable condition determined by genitalia at birth. And let's be clear, like whatever the politics, this is the most drastic move yet by the government to ro roll back recognition and protection of transgender people using federal civil rights law. And it has huge implications, not only for people here, but across the globe in many different and negative ways that, that we'll talk about. But having said that, I, I really want to say that it's not as though prior to the Trump administration, everything was rosy. 
right? Uh, things are not simple. It's not as if a sexual rights agenda was moving forward globally that was led or supported by the U.S. without problems. And beyond the issues of abortion or reproductive rights or sexual rights, particularly in relationship to sexual orientation and gender identity, but also in terms of violence and, and adolescent sexuality, there was already a big tangle, if you like, between South-North, North-South, South-South, and North-North politics, a situation that really wasn't helped when political leaders of governments such as, I have to say, the U.S. under Obama or the U.K. under Cameron, uh, who claimed in their, for, in their foreign policy that their approach to sexual rights, for example, in, relation, in relationship to sexual orientation, had to be mirrored elsewhere. So I guess the first point that I'm trying to make here is that sexual rights denotes very different things depending on actor and context. And in terms of actors at a very general level, when we think about governments and political leaders, it's important to distinguish what they say and do within their own countries and how this connects or disconnects with their foreign policy and what this means in terms of how they act or don't act within the halls of the UN. And this can be the same or it can be quite different, all of which impacts on the legal, the political, and the technical standards that we who are concerned with advancing human rights and global health have to deal with. So let me move specifically into what I'm talking about here. There are three overlapping streams that I want to suggest that can shape much of the current global landscape around health and rights. And I'm going to loosely, loosely put these as the technical, the legal, and the political. Um, as I'm talking here about the technical, I'm talking about the concepts, the norms, the standards, the guidelines that are developed by research organizations, by academic institutions, and in particular, for these purposes, international organizations like the World Health Organization. Within the legal stream, I'm putting uh, the formal parts of the human rights system, including the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights at the UN level, the UN treaty monitoring bodies, and other formal mechanisms at the international level, but also international, regional, and national court decisions. And in the political stream, I'm including international, regional, and national government processes with particular um, uh, emphasis on the agreements that are made by states with one another as these play out at the global level. For example, what comes out of the General Assembly, like the Sustainable Development Goals. And the point I want to make here is that the streams have significant influence on one another, but that they are sufficiently distinct in orientation and priority that my hope is, is that by naming them in this way and separating them out, um, that we can see the why and the how of the advancements and the retrenchments that take place, but ultimately that we can think about how best to deal with what's happening. So let me start with the political. Sexual rights uh, at the global political level starts from sexual health. So starting with 1994 in the International Conference on Population and Development, which was, amongst other things, the first intergovernmental agreement that attempted to define sexual health and is relevant for our purposes as part of reproductive rights. Now, Cairo defined reproductive rights, if not sexual rights, um, but what's important is that they defined reproductive rights as part of reproductive health. Now, with respect to sexual rights, per se, arguably there's no language that's important, uh, as important as the political articulation in the Beijing Platform for Action in, uh, from 1995. And a few things to say about this. It appears in the health chapter of the document, and it importantly not only builds on Cairo, but it grounds its articulation not only in politics, but within the international agreed legal uh, framework. Now, the focus on women is problematic for many reasons, as we can see now. But it's important historically not to forget that this focus by governments on the health and rights of women was essential in providing for the first time an international mandate to focus on and invest in women's reproductive and sexual health and rights beyond the need to control women's fertility as part of a demographic agenda. Right, with no thought for their uh, individual health and well-being. There are a number of concerns we can look to in terms of this def definition at this point. Not only is it limited to women, it's focused only on health and its application and scope. And the point I want to make here is sexual rights are relevant only because of their implications for health, a point that I want to keep coming back to.
It also contains uh, several other areas of concern, for example, a focus on the words freely and responsibly, responsibly as defined by who, and using what criteria. Right? So, but this is again the first intergovernmental articulation of what has become known as sexual rights. And the point I'm trying to make here is that Cairo and Beijing, perhaps because they're ostensibly endorsed by the majority of the governments of the world, to this day, in 2018, despite the decades that have passed, remain the touchstone that undergirds sexual rights in all spheres. Now, as a historical matter, there were a number of countries that took reservations to this, saying that they wanted no part in endorsing this whatsoever, who continue to raise objections at a global level and often cite the lack of international agreement on what sexual rights mean uh, as their reason for uh, not supporting sexual rights now. And I don't want to get into the specifics of that, except to say there were several countries who took it upon themselves in 1995 to state specifically that they absolutely wanted, sta wanted it stated on the record that this definition of sexual rights as set forth in this document was absolutely the definition that they bought into. And those governments were India, Bolivia, Colombia, Panama, El Salvador, uh, Cambodia, South Africa, Tanzania, and Cameroon. And so it's important to remember those countries and the roles that they then play, not only historically, but moving forward, okay? So fast forwarding to more recent times, perhaps the most forward-looking political articulation of sexual rights happened in 2013 uh, with this intergovernmental Latin American and Caribbean review. And you'll note that this Montevideo consensus is the first intergovernmental political document to actually name the word sexual rights and to make it clear that they don't extend only to women. In this regard, it's also worth noting that it's Latin American governments who have been some of the key champions uh, of the, at the global level through to this day. Now, um, debates on sexual rights in these international political fora will always go back to Cairo and Beijing. Also in 2013, the Asia-Pacific uh, Declaration on Population and Development, which happened later in that same year, tried to blend these two definitions. Now, the breakdown of countries and objections and support here, I think, is quite telling. 38 countries endorsed this definition, including the United States. But a number of countries, like Nepal, raised objections about this new attempt to define sexual rights. Now, not surprisingly, Azerbaijan, Iran, and the Russian Federation explicitly voted against the declaration. And because we're in the US, and because I'm a US citizen, I feel like I have to say something about the US uh, in terms of what they've been saying and doing in global spaces around sexual rights, because it does raise some important issues. Going back now to the Obama administration, who in many ways was, or which in many ways was one of the most forward-looking in their approach to sexual rights, um, even with Obama, perhaps nothing is more telling than the statement they put forward at the UN Women's Executive Board in 2015. Now, it was heralded by many. The US said for the first time they would begin to use the term sexual rights in human rights and development discussions. And in doing so, they explicitly drew on paragraph 96 from Beijing and extended it beyond women to say that it referred to all individuals. But then, and this is the key part for me, is that they go on to say that the term sexual rights express rights which are not legal, legally binding. Sexual rights are not human rights and they are not enshrined in international human rights law. In my mind, this is a prime example of a government cherry-picking part of a definition to suit their purposes. But the confusion in terms of what this means about variations between the political and the legally binding nature of rights, and by extension the ways in which the political, the legal, and the technical are sometimes but not always consistent with one another is the point that I think I'm, try I'm trying to make here. Now, in terms of the Sustainable Development Goals, which is agree are arguably the blueprint for our future, it's ostensibly framed around the idea of no one being left behind. Um, and let's be clear, even the Sustainable Development Goals have this rather odd formulation uh, in terms of how they look at sexual and reproductive 
uh, health and rights. So look at the mismatch between the term sexual and reproductive when it comes to healthcare services, but only the focus on reproductive health when you talk about national strategies and programs. Now, this inconsistency in terminology has had major implications for the targets, for the indicators that are set, and with major implications for the data that are collected by countries, therefore for what funding is made available, what programs are put into place, even at the most local level. And issues, topics, uh, rights that address the diversity of sexualities, the, intersexual, uh, the intersection of sexual and gender diversity, let alone sexual rights, are nowhere part of the basic uh, SDG agenda. Now, even in the gender uh, goal of the SDGs, at least it signals uh, attention to interventions that will improve equality between women and men. But it's fairly clear here that the gender intended in the SDGs is a static male-female binary. And once again, note that while sexual and reproductive health is explicit and reproductive rights are explicit, sexual rights are not. So if we see the SDGs as the blueprint for our future and want to ensure no one's left behind, we need to see these limitations clearly and to think strategically about how the SDGs can nonetheless be used to support sexual rights for all people so that all people can flourish even in this current political moment. Now, as for the legal, an interesting trend has occurred in legal protections for sexual rights. At the global level, uh, particularly in relationship to sexual orientation and gender identity, entities within the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights have increased efforts to protect people from discrimination and violence on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity, but they don't use the term sexual rights to do this. When the term sexual rights is used in this arena, it's primarily about women and women who are assumed to be in heterosexual sexual relationships and often drawing on Beijing. Health has been the strategic entry point within the international legal sphere, particularly linked to HIV, with some major uh, advances being made through key international and national rulings necessary for public health, but without a focus on sexual rights as relevant to people's lives for any reason other than health, if you see what I mean. Now, I'm about to show you some rights, so I'm just going to show you the treaties that they are drawn from, and of importance are which human rights are considered to make up the orbit of sexual rights within the legal sphere. Now, the UN treaty monitoring bodies give attention to the application of all of these rights in terms of what they mean for sexuality, and I think most relevant here is this right to sexual and reproductive um, to sexual reproductive health, which the UN Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights has named. But it's fair to say that the growth of sexual rights within the legal sphere has been particularly framed on protections from discrimination and violence, whether this focuses on sexual orientation or heterosexual women, and all is in some way linked to the health context, not about sexual rights in their own right. Now, at a technical level, interestingly, it's 1987 at the European level that they were the first to flag the importance uh, of the legal and policy environment for sexuality, for health, and to note this in relationship to homosexuality and abortion. And more than a decade later, in 2000, um, the Pan American Health Organization provided the first clear articulation of how human rights are thought to be relevant to sexual health and explicitly names sexual rights in 2000 now, right? Um, and in many ways, this still drives the approach taken by WHO and other technical agencies uh, in relationship to sexual rights. Now, the the history between 2000 and the present aren't worth getting into. The only point I'm trying to make here is that WHO has been the most willing to use the fact that it's a technical agency and that its work is based on evidence to try to avoid the political constraints in order to push the envelope towards rights protections. And note here, for, for sexual health to be attained, sexual rights for all people must be respected. So suffice it to say that this, which is on the WHO website, albeit a working definition, is brings together the technical, the legal, and the political in terms of trying to make its case from a technical perspective. So okay, so what's the point of all of this, right? All right, 
the work of WHO, OHCHR, and the international organizations um, has led to a technical and an increasingly legal understanding that sexual rights are both relevant to all populations and grounded in international and regional human rights documents. At a global level, actors in each sphere rely on the definitions of the other. And while the political represents the lowest common denominator across all, legal definitions use the political and the technical to undergird the legitimacy of their positions, particularly as it concerns links between sexuality and human rights. For the technical, most apparent, I think, in the work of WHO, they use evidence. And their evidence includes legal definitions as evidence to give shape and support uh, their framing of sexual rights as necessary for sexual health. And they tend to bring human rights and law into this definition because they see human rights and law as relevant to health outcomes. So the focus is not on rights per se, but because the promotion of or the impediment of sexual rights is going to impact health outcomes. And the emphasis on health in all of this, um, at real, I mean, I think shows that at this point in time, for almost all actors in the global space, at the intergovernmental level. Health is the justification for dealing with sexual rights, and not rights pertaining to sexuality for all people for their own sake. The political environment ultimately plays the critical role in which issues are taken up, which are left aside, including in the technical and the legal. And so despite all these advances, and now in 2018, there are no universal political standards that recognize anyone who is not an adult woman, including men and trans populations, to have sexual rights. Nor are sexual rights, at least at a political level, yet valid for any reasons other than health, right? So let me use the current issues around the international classification of diseases to show how this interplay has real implications for the lives of transgender populations. And let me say something quickly about the ICD, um, as I think this offers a really very real way in why we need to pay attention to this legal, political, technical in in interchange. Um, so I think people know the ICD is relevant to all countries of the world. It has huge re implications for, for resources and for the ways in which billing is done across a globe, and it allows um, for a unification in terms of being able to, to discuss health issues and work on health issues across countries. But the last time that the ICD was updated was in 1990. Okay, so something, so everything I've talked to has happened since the last time the ICD had been updated. So this is how the ICD 10, which was the ICD in place, uh, conceptualized being transgender. So of course the key thing to note is that transsexualism is listed as a mental and behavioral disorder, but you also need to note this binary oppositional language of opposite sex that basically denotes a static female and a static male conceptualization of gender. So like I said, the WHO ICD classifications are intended to provide a basis for utilization of services, uh, but the creation and use of ICD classifications go much further because they have huge implications at national level in all sorts of different ways. We could focus on the US here, but just take a look at Russia. I think this is a really telling example. Restrictions on driving by transgender populations are put out by the Russian government uh, in 2014 based on the ICD classification because trans issues appear to be a mental and behavioral disorder, right? So when you're thinking about gender markers and identity cards, generally, you have to think about how that is an, that is an implication for your driving, but it's for your voting in terms of accessing and using health services, and thinking in terms of now with the US, in terms of the, the debates that are happening here right now, just think about how the gender marker on your identity card impacts all aspects of your life and what it is that we're, we're gonna do in terms of what the Trump administration is trying to do. So, 
when the revision process was starting, the first thing that had to happen was it had to happen through WHO, and it was these two departments together that were working on the revision with a lot of external consultation. So the first question was whether transgender phenomena should be removed entirely from the ICD. And I raise this because I think it is a question that could well be asked. But after extensive consultation with transgender groups from around the world, it was clear that transgender groups really wanted the um, transgender uh, phenomena to be included within the ICD, just not under a mental behavioral disorder section. And the reason had to do with access to hormones, access to uh, silicone, access to uh, appropriate health services, which would be, and therefore the, the fact of needing access through uh, inclusion in the ICD more generally. So in terms of how to think about what this definition would look like, it was important to think about all of these issues that I think all make sense except for the very last bullet, which I want to get to, which is that the definition had to be acceptable not only to transgender people, healthcare professionals and researchers, but to member states meaning to governments, whether governments would be comfortable with this technical definition and what it is that, and how it would come about. So there were two categories that were proposed, uh, and I'm gonna focus only on the gender incongruence of adolescence and adulthood, and to say, first of all, that this is the definition that was ultimately uh, agreed to at a technical level, and I wanna say that it is in a new chapter called sexual health. So it is no longer in a section on mental and behavioral disorders. It is in a new section that is called sexual health. And I want to point out in terms of looking at this definition that what you'll see about the definition it is the fact that it goes beyond uh, the binary as a way of kind of defining who we are as people. And it has a, a much broader framework for how it is that it sets itself up. Um, Okay, so here's where we are now. It's been almost 20 years since the last revision. And this, in this time, we've had all of the developments in the sexual rights arena I mentioned earlier. Now, on 18 June of this year, the WHO released a version of this ICD. And what they said is that it was necessary to allow member states time to plan implementation. So it has come out as a technical document, okay? Now, this is anticipating the presentation of ICD-11 at the World Health Assembly in 2019 for adoption by countries that is going to move it into the political realm, right? So it has no legal status, but countries will adopt it. Um, and out of that WHO, uh, WHA process, it then becomes something that becomes part of national law. Now, the reason I raise it in the context of this talk the ICD is ostensibly a technical manual, but it's ultimately voted on by a political body, not by a technical one. And as you can see from the Russian example I just showed you, and you can think about the current efforts of the Trump administration, um, you can see how these definitions are going to be mired in politics and, and with the, the real world implications of what's happening in terms of what this is going to mean for people's lives based upon what is meant to be something that is technical. And so please, I ask you to keep an eye towards the World Health Assembly in 2019 and to be thinking for those of us who care about these issues what that space means and what it is that we're going to be able to do to try to ensure that actually the document that is adopted is based on technical considerations, not political considerations. So I want to close by raising a couple of big picture issues for the future. Uh, for some, I'll just go through them fairly quickly. Uh, others, I might want to elaborate just, just a, a little bit. Um, so first is whether we actually need agreement on termin terminology, content, and legal status of sexual rights. Um, does it matter if sexual rights are considered to be part of international human rights law and therefore enforceable? Or does it matter that they just exist as concept and are not yet legally enforceable? Does this make a difference for how we think about working with sexual rights? Is it necessary to think about uh, 
making the links between sexual rights and reproductive rights more overt. For many years, sexual rights advocates were pushing for distinguishing sexual rights from reproductive rights. But increasingly, progressive voices are actually pushing for linkages between them. For example, the decision to carry or terminate a pregnancy can be seen as an aspect of a woman's capacity to, to decide to link or to de-link sexual activity from the decision to become a parent. So what's to be gained or lost in giving, given this current geopolitical space by making the linkages more explicit? Um, what about pleasure? Uh, we talk about sexual rights and sexual health, but what about sexual pleasure? Now, historically, sexual health and sexual rights policies and programs have tended to focus on preventing negative consequences associated with sexuality, such as unintended, unintended pregnancies, HIV, STIs, pregnancy, uh, and addressing sexual dysfunction. So the importance of addressing the negative consequences of sexual health behaviors is clear. But in many cases, this approach fails to recognize that some of the primary factors behind sexual health risk are issues that relate not only to rights, but to sexual desire and to the seeking of pleasure and not to morbidities and, and mortalities. So how much of this is or should be the business of the state? Uh, putting pleasure at the center as an element that's intrinsically linked to sexual health and sexual rights seems like it could be a good thing, but is it going too far? And so it's an important kind of debate, I think, that it, that's worth thinking about. Um, gender. Now, diverse understandings of, of gender, particularly connected to the varied streams of sexual rights work, continue to cause problems in the political, the technical, and the legal developments around sexual rights. But gender and sexual systems are linked, but they're not identical, right? And it matters for rights works because the legal and policy work needed to end restrictions on sexual uh, behavior, including same-sex behavior, is not identical to the legal and policy change needed to defend various gendered behaviors and identities. So rights clearly have to be understood to attach in both domains, the, gen the gendered and the sexual, but different rights and different policies need to be responded to. In terms of people under the age of 18, um, there's increasing attention uh, to heterosexual, homosexual, trans, and intersex rights and debates around young people, and there are positive advances um, but these tend to be in relationship to rights relating to access and use of health services. We see far less in terms of actionable rights affirming the sexual rights of people under the age of 18. Now, banning child marriage is clearly something that we all want, but should this be one and the same with banning adolescent sexuality? And I think it's something that we should talk about. Now, there's also this issue about who gets counted. Um, as we find ourselves in this SDG world and we consider how best to support a diverse sexual rights agenda, uh, we have to consider how we're going to measure progress uh, in this context. So first there's this problem of normative inclusion. Only some sexual rights, as linked to reproductive rights, as linked to conventional women, are included in the SDGs. So issues, topics, and rights that address the diversity of sexualities, the intersection of sexuality and gender diversity, let alone sexual rights at their most basic, are not visible. Which groups, which donors, which UN agencies, which nations are going to develop the frameworks to support uh, the programming and produce the data for these potential measurements of progress within an SDG framework? Equally importantly, I'm a dog owner, so I'm going to say indicators are, tails, are the tail that wags the dog. But, you know, indicators are, in my mind, the tail that wags the dog. How can these measurement exercises be used to promote shifts in gendered sexualities that tend not only towards health, but towards more tolerant states of mind so that sexual rights can flourish for all people? Um, finally, I guess my biggest concern is about the next generation. As we all know, uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights generate strong opinions that are often steeped in social values, in ideology, in religion, in morality. 
the next generation of researchers, of implementers, of policymakers and advocates, how or what they understand about sexual and reproductive health and rights are key to where the field will be in 10 years, let alone in 20 years. How do we make sure, beyond what's happening here at Drexel, right, but how do we make sure that the political does not get in the way of what people need to learn in order to be effective researchers, programmers, policymakers, and frankly, good human beings? Um, so I just want to end uh, by saying something about um, what this means for engaging human rights in global health work more generally. So from my perspective, there needs to be systematic and rigorous attention to definitions, to human rights standards, to law, and to public health evidence for work in global health to be able to take us where we want it. And that this is going to require support for research, for teaching, for training that is not siloed, but that tries to bring these strands together. Now, who's vulnerable or disadvantaged is going to vary between countries and within countries. But we need vigilance amongst us all to ensure that focus now and in the future on human rights results in better decision making, both locally and globally, at a technical level, at a legal level, and at a political level. Now, Jonathan was born in 1947, the year that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was drafted. When he died, we talked about how ironic it was that his life spanned and reflected the same 50 years, 1948 to 1998, as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And now, in those 50 years, the worlds of health and human rights had, had evolved, but along parallel but kind of distinct tracks. But it was Jonathan Mann who brought them together. And it's hard to believe, but 20 years have passed since he died. This December 10th will celebrate the Universal Declaration's 70 years. Jonathan's vision and work was concerned with ensuring greater support for the health and human rights of all people everywhere in the world and without distinction. This is a legacy we must all commit to taking forward wherever we are and whatever work we do and even in these complicated political times. Thank you. Moderating myself? Go ahead. I will moderate myself. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. I, I have a question about the transition from ICD 9 to 10 when homosexuality was de declassified as a disease. Uh, are there lessons to be learned from this, that success that can be applied to the things we had at ICD 11? So one of the reasons that I raised the question as that about whether it should be taken out entirely was precisely because people were, we were learning lessons from what had happened in ICD-9 in terms of the declassification of homosexuality. And so the reason that the question was raised primarily to transgender groups from around the world, there was a meeting that was called precisely to discuss should it be taken out entirely as was tried to be done in terms of that. And so I think the lesson is, is the need to consult with groups, but I think that as a result, the lesson was also in this case, this is something we want to keep in, but in a non-pathologizing way. Uh, thanks, Sophia. Uh, two questions. One, um, the recent Good Marker Lancet Commission for the Messiah tried to provide an integrated and comprehensive definition of sexual and productive health and rights. I wonder what you think about it. And secondly, um, why have we been able to achieve greater success in the regional platforms for SRH than at the global level? If you look at the Maputo plan of action, video consensus, there's it's been a lot of progress at the regional level, and yet when you come to the global level, it's been difficult to achieve the same level of consensus. What's going on and why is that? Well, that's it. that's an easy one. Let me try. Let me know. Uh, okay. In terms of the point, the first point, I think that I mean you probably did too. I mean I reviewed that that the commission's report and and I mean I thought that the definition in there is very good, right? I think the problem with the definition it is has no it has no standing. It's not legal. It's not political. 
right? And is it technical, right? So there's a question now. If that definition becomes, if do people know what we're talking about? The 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 Lancet uh, Guttmacher Commission on Sexual Reproductive Health and Rights, right? Um, which put forward, uh, uh, amongst other things, in a, in a very comprehensive and very good report, put forward a definition of sexual and, but it was not of sexual rights. It was of sexual and reproductive health and rights, right? So it did not. It, but what it did is it came forward with a group of experts in a very useful way. But the question then becomes, how do you move that into the sphere of nation states and how they engage? And I'm, I'm not totally sure that they nailed that one in terms of how they've done that. In terms of the second question about regional platforms, I mean, there's a, a couple of things, which is uh, the regional platforms have also been places where things have gone backwards. Right. It's not that they've all been perfect. Right. At all. And there have certainly been advances that have been able to take place at the global level. I do think that the if I can say these words, the horse trading that occurs at the global level um, amongst uh, very wealthy countries and countries that have a lot less negotiating power has resulted in some of the real um, re pullbacks that we've seen. And certainly, I mean, I, again, I will call out the United States, certainly the United States has played a major role um, of late, in particular, in terms of trying to pull back consensus. I think one of the reasons, I think I'm answering your question, one of the reasons why in 2018 we're still talking about Cairo and Beijing, I mean, that's insane, right? But one of the reasons is because that was the last time we had uniform consensus. And so what happens is in all political negotiations since then, we're always able to say no rolling back on Cairo, no rolling back on Beijing. And so as a result, they, get, they, be, they, they gain an exalted status because they become the one that we never want to go back from. And so in some ways at the global level, it becomes much harder harder to move things forward because we're always saying don't go back from Cairo and Beijing, whereas at the regional level, ideas can move forward. Okay, I'm an optimist, all right? Let me start with that, right? Um, so I actually think that there is a path forward, and I think one of the reasons that I really called out what's happening right now is I think we need a lot of global activism happening right now in this year. And I think that in terms of the partners that we have within this state, within this country, and across countries, we need to be aware of what's happening at IC, for, in terms of ICD-11, right? I, I think that one of the things that I worry about is because WHO put, put it out, um, that I think that at a human level, people don't realize it doesn't yet have standing, right? Because they did this big thing, they didn't take it through its political process. Now, is it better, I'm sort of answering your question, but I'll, I'll get to it, is like, it's, is it better to say, look, things are really dicey right now, let's not take it to the assembly next year, right, in terms of thinking about the U.S.'s position? Is it better to think about that because we recognize that in terms of what it means, um, what the politics mean for what's going to happen technically? In terms of whether things can move forward nationally within countries, I think things are moving forward because of it. And so this is where the optimism comes in, which is to say it's, it's a very useful framework for advocates to be able to use with their national governments, to be able to say, look, this has come forward. Where the pushback comes is where there's a savvy government minister who doesn't want it, who then says, look, there's no, it has no status. Do you see what I mean? So it really comes down to how we use it and how we work with it. Um, wow. Yeah. OK. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, how has human rights uh, tied in with uh, the DSM uh, classification of homosexuality as a mental illness? Um, with getting rid of that in um, 1987, like what has human rights work done um, in terms of that? 
uh, sure. And that's a, is that a microphone in a box? Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of, it's kind of wild. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so, okay, it's pretty cool. All right. I've never, never seen anything quite like that. Okay. Um, so let me respond to your question, not to be blown away by technology. Okay. Um, so a couple of things. I also want to say that the DSM is used much more in this country and that we have been much slower to take on the ICD. Um, in general, we're always behind an ICD or so. Um, it took us a long time for us to even get up to speed on ICD-10 now that we're about to switch to ICD-11. Um, and so in this country, the DSM is much more the framework, uh, but it is not in other countries. And so I, I think it's important just to clarify the relationship between the DSM and, and, and the ICD. Um, I think that human rights activism um, has had a lot to do with the move towards changing both what was in the DSM and in the ICD. Um, but I want to say that it was human rights activism grounded in evidence. And I think the evidence issue is really important and one I don't want us to forget because activism in terms of trying to, to change things that are in technical manuals, activism requires evidence in order to convince the skeptics and in order to convince people who are not necessarily politically on the same page, but will work with what um, evidence they are given. And certainly in terms of thinking about the changes that have happened in terms of um, the ICD um, more, more recently, I think that um, Actually, I'll tell a little story that maybe is relevant just on that really quickly. Um, I was an intern. When I first started to work with Jonathan Mann, I was an intern at the Global Program on AIDS, right? And, uh, in that, and I was blown away that homosexuality was uh, in the ICD um, at that time. Um, and, I, I, and I said, well, how can this be? And, you know, we need to do something. And, uh, you know, and, and of course this has to change everybody who's a reasonable person here, like whatever. And I was, you know, still in law school. And, you know, and, and uh, the, what I got was, so what's the evidence base? What's the evidence base for changing it? Not just what do you think, but what's the evidence base? And I think that was a real learning for me in terms of being able to say that it's, it's the evidence base not only in terms of how it is that communities experience it, but it's about the evidence base as the language of communities can then be translated into words that policymakers and people at an institutional level can understand. Microphone in a box. Yeah, microphone in a box. It's exciting. Um, so I'm curious, you talked a lot about um, kind of the ICD and the ICD as kind of No, it's a great it's a great question, and and here's here's the thing, I'm not anti health outcomes. Okay, just to be really clear, like I I think it's the wedge that has opened the door, but I I think that to say that I've had a lot of pushback from friends who are rights advocates who are not in the health community, who say rights matter for rights' sake, that if there was no health benefit our rights are still our rights, and I 100% believe that. And so I sometimes wonder whether the instrumental approach to try to open the door in this way, whether there's something we need to pay attention to in terms of what that means. I, I don't know who I'm calling on, who's ever got the box? I don't need the box. So, thank you for uh, one But it does feel like we're moving backwards. Some of that is because we are, and some of that is because the media and techno brings it to us in different ways what we're aware of. Having said that, I'd like to hear your thoughts about the role of academia in a partnership with advocates and activists during this time. So for a specific example, the um, trans individuals, allies, uh, my own LGBTQ community that marched yesterday at City Hall largely have no idea about this field 
this movement, mm. those of us in this auditorium, except for those who moved between. And during the HIV era, at that time, a lot of us locked arms with advocates and activists. And mm. when that happened, that dial started to move. So, so how about now? Because the divisiveness that's going on seems mm -hmm. to, as I said earlier, to break us apart further. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how you and your work and your experience um, I'm not sure I'm gonna have a good answer but I'm gonna I'm just gonna just just on, on, on that um, I do think we're moving backwards um, I do think and I also was teaching and at a very baby level but I and in that moment right and and what I'm conscious of is the fact that I've never felt it like this and the the question about what this means, I think the I think there's two issues. It's the it's the locking arms, but it is in terms of the younger generation. It really is, and it's just a question in terms of being able to give support to people who frame arguments not necessarily the way that academics frame them, and to recognize that, for example, yeah. right? And so um, and to recognize like the the importance of different modalities that we didn't necessarily use before, right? And so it's about understanding better, like I'm clear that I am terrible on social media, right? I'm, you know, um, but I have colleagues who are really great with social media. And I think that one of the things to be able to think about in terms of what this means, I think there's never been a moment in my history where I felt so much the need for this locking of arms that you're talking about. And I think that one of the things that I worry about in academia is people being afraid to speak up. And I think one of the things that is really complicated and really hard is that I think that our role has never been more important, and yet there have never been more reasons to be silent. And, and so I think that there's a, I mean, in, in, in different, I have colleagues, we all have colleagues at different universities who talk about, particularly people who work at, um, state schools, um, not in private universities who work at state schools and who are being silenced all the time now in terms of being able to talk about the sorts of issues I talked about today. And so I think that, I think it's incredibly important that we offer support to those colleagues um, and recognize that we have a lot more ability to say things. I'm, I'm saying way more now than maybe I ever have, not particularly in this room today, but in general, because I think that it's a responsibility at this time and I have the freedom of working at a private university. I mean, I'm going to try. I'll try. I mean, it, 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 I raised it as a conundrum because in my mind it is a conundrum, which is why I'm not clear, all right? So let me just kind of agree. Um, I come from a tradition where we spent a lot of time trying to de-link sexual rights and reproductive rights, right? And I come from a time where, where that was absolutely critically important. And so when I first started to hear finally they're separated, now everybody's saying putting back together. I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> right? So like, so, but, but I trust the people, per, I, I trust that the forward lookingness of people who go way beyond where I am in terms of their thinking. And um, there are, the, and it is absolutely true, if you think about it, that there are links between them and to ignore them is perhaps not intellectually, I'm not politically now, but not intellectually honest. 
And so the question becomes, is it something where we can think about being intellectually honest and recognize where those issues overlap and where they are distinct, and then make our choices around activism, around politics, but around interventions, where it makes sense to bring them together or not, rather than consistently saying, let's keep them apart. Right? And like I say, I raised it as a conundrum because I can't say to you this is the way I go. Okay? Oh, okay, and then pleasure, right? Pleasure. So what was the question about pleasure? I didn't actually ask the question about pleasure. Okay, you just mentioned pleasure. Yeah, well, one of my other questions was it was more of a thought, and I'm curious if you agree with me or not, but you talked about including the role of pleasure in underwrites and the right to pleasure. And in my mind, I'm thinking, well, the WHO defines like health as not just the absence of illness, but you know, a state of well being. And to me, pleasure is. I hear you, I hear you, but it's still within a framework of sexual health. And so, and I think where I think it's confusing, coming back to it, was a conundrum, right? I didn't raise it as a, like, I, I, you know, it's a conundrum. Um, is that the thing for me about, about pleasure is that pleasure drives many of the decisions we make, whether or not they may cause sexual ill health like a, a desire for pleasure, right? And, and so one of the things about better acknowledging pleasure, look, we spend a lot of time thinking about reproductive rights and in all these different ways saying, keep the state out of the bedroom. So all of a sudden we're saying, and for pleasure, we're gonna bring the state in? I don't think so, right? And so it's complicated in the sense that I'm not sure, I, I open it as something that I think we all need to do more work on and more thinking on kind of in this next period of time. And, and I would be very curious to, to be brought along to kind of figure out where to sit with this. I'm, I'm part of a, um, a, a group of people that has been trying to kind of think about this issue. And, um, and what's interesting is that we all recognize that sexual rights, sexual health, and sexual pleasure form part of a triangle. But when we start to think about what obligations attach and what that actually means is where it starts to get more confusing. So I'm, I'm clear that the three go together in a way that I was not maybe five years ago. But what to do with that is where I would love more thoughts. Okay? It's not a question, but it's a, it's a, a declaration and a, a gratitude. Awesome, and for me too, but I want this I want the picture too. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay.